Hey, Max. Hey, hey. Hello. Hey, hey. Hello. Well, welcome to the YouTube channel and in just a moment to the podcast. And everyone out there, if you're watching, you know, please put your thoughts and comments into the live chat and we'll try to make it part of the show. If you're watching afterwards, well, no live chat, but thanks for watching. And with that, Max, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Well, it's good to be back uh, back on the show. And now I know it's live too, so no uh, no mistakes. So I'm going to try to not say anything outrageous. But I've, people get the unfiltered <laughs> version. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I love it when people come check out the live show. Yeah, yeah so uh, welcome back. It's been a little while since you were on the show, about since September. We talked about Superset. We also talked a little bit about Airflow, some of the stuff that you've been working on. And now we're kind of circling back through this data side of things, but uh, you know, trying to bring AI into the whole story. So pretty cool project that I'm looking forward to talking to you about. Awesome. I'm excited to talk about it too. And these things are, are related in, in many ways. Like one common uh, foundation is Python. Like a lot of these projects are in Python. Uh, they're data mm -hmm. related. And here, Promptimize and, and Prompt Engineering and Integrating AI is related in, in a way that we're building some AI features into superset right now and into, into preset. So it, it ties things together in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can certainly see a lot of synergy here. Um, so I guess before we dive into it, it hasn't been that long since you were on the show, but give us a quick update, uh, just a bit about your background for people who don't know you before and um, what have you been up to? Yeah, so you know my, my career is a career of like maybe 20 or so years in data building, doing data engineering, doing, um, trying to make useful data useful for organizations. Um, over the past decade or so, I've been very involved in open source. I started Apache Airflow in 2014. So for those not familiar with Airflow, though it's pretty well known now as used that I heard like, I think it's like tens of thousands, I think above a hundred thousand companies are using Apache Airflow, which is kind of insane to think about. It's like you start a little project. So for me, I started, started this project at Airbnb and it really took off. And I think it's just like great it's called a project community fit. Like people really need it, needed that. It was the right abstraction for people at the time and still today. And it just, it just really took off. So I was working on orchestration and then, um, then I was like, I just love things that are visual and interactive. So um, there was no, great open source BI tool out there, business intelligence. So this whole data, data dashboarding, exploration, SQL IDE. So it's like a playground for people trying to understand and visualize and explore data. So I started working on Apache Superset in 2000, I think it was like 15 or 16 at Airbnb too. And we also brought that to the Apache Software Foundation. So uh, again, like a, a very, very popular open source project that's used in like tens, tens of thousands, a hundred thousand organizations or so. Uh, and a great, like today, like it, it has become a super great open source alternative to Tableau Looker, like all those business intelligence tools is very viable for organizations. Um, and then quick, quick plugs at preset IO a company I started. So I'm also an entrepreneur. I started a company uh, a little bit more than four years ago around Apache superset. And the idea is to bring, uh, bring Superset to the masses. So it's really like hosted, managed, state-of-the-art Apache Superset for everyone with some bells and whistles. So uh, the best Superset you can run, there's a there's a free version too. So you can go and play and try it, you know, uh, today get started in five minutes. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a commercial pointer, but very, also very relevant to what I've been doing, you know, personally over the past like three or four I'm sure years. it's some, some of the inspiration for some of the things we're going to talk about as well and trying to bring some of the AI craziness back to products, right? From an engineering perspective, not just a, hey, look, I, I asked it uh, what basketball team was going to, you know, win this year and it gave me this answer, right? It's like, and I, and caveats, I don't know anything that happened since 2021. So AI <laughs> exactly. or and AI specifically, Bart is a little bit better at that, but it's like, uh, you know, the last thing I read off of the internet was in fall 2021. Uh, <laughs> It makes some things a little bit challenging, but yeah. So, so we're looking. To, we're building, you know, AI features into preset. You know, as a commercial open source company, we need we need to build some differentiators too from supersets. So we contribute a huge amount, like maybe 50, 80 percent of the work we do at preset is contributed back to superset. 
but we're looking to build um, differentiators. And we feel like AI is a, is a great uh, kind of commercial differentiator too on top of, on top of SuperSet that makes people even more interested to come and, and run, uh, run, run preset too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, excellent. And you know, people, you say they were popular, popular uh, projects like airflow has 30,000 stars. Apache superset has 50,000 stars, which puts it on par with Django and flask for people sort of <laughs> mental models out there, which is, I would say it's pretty well known. So awesome. You yeah, know, stars are kind of vanity metric in some ways, yeah, it right? So it's, it's not necessarily like usefulness or value delivered, but it's a proxy for popularity and hype, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it gives a good sense. And I think like at 50,000 star stars, if you look at, you know, it's probably in the top 100 of GitHub projects. If you remove, if you remove the, in the top 100, there's, there's a lot of documentations and guides and things that are not really open source projects. So it's probably like top 100 open source project ish, you know, in both cases, which is right. Uh, it's really cool. Like it's like you start a project, yeah. you don't know like how, like whether it's going to take off and how, and you know, it's like, wow, it's, it's just nice to see that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on one hand it's, it's, it's nice, but it doesn't necessarily make it better, <laughs> but it does yeah. mean there's a lot of people using it. There's a lot of polish. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of PRs and stuff that have been submitted to, to make it work. A lot of things it can plug into, right? So there, there's certainly a value for having a project popular versus unpopular. Oh my God, yes. And I would say one thing is, you know, all the doc, like, call it like secondary assets outside of the core projects documentation. And there will be a lot of like use cases and testimonials and reviews and people bending the framework in various ways and forks and plugins. Another thing too, that people, I think, don't really understand the value of in, in software and open source is, uh, or I'm sure people understand the value, but it's not talked about. It's just a whole battle tested thing. Like when something is run at thousands of organizations in production for a long time, uh, there's a there's there's a lot of things that happen in a software that are very very valuable for the incremental organization adopting it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk large language models for a second. So AI means different things to different people, right? And um, it, they, they kind of get carved off as they find some kind of productive <laughs> productized use, right? AI is this general term and like, oh, machine learning is now a thing that we've done or computer vision is a thing we've done. And the large language models are sort of starting to find their own their own special space. So maybe we could talk a bit about a, a couple of examples just so people get a sense. I mean, to me, chat GPT seems like the most well-known. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, if you, well, I'll say if you think about like what is a large language model yeah. and what are some of the leaps there? And I'm not an expert, so I'm going to try to not put my foot <laughs> in my mouth. But some things that I think are interesting, a large language model is a big neural network that is trained on a big corpus of text. I think one of the big leaps we've seen is unsupervised learning. So like really often like in machine learning in the past or, or pre LLMs, we would have very specific like training set and outcomes we were looking for. And then the training data would have to be really structured here. What we're doing with large language models is feeding a lot of huge corpus of text and what the large language model is trying to do or resolve is to chain words, right? So it's trying to predict the next word, which seems like you, you would be able to put words together that kind of makes sense, but like you wouldn't think that consciousness, not just like consciousness, but intelligence would come out of that, but somehow it yeah. does, right? Like if you chain, it's like, if you say, you know, Humpty Dumpty that he sits on a, it's really clear it's going to be wall, you know, right. the next word. Uh, but if you push this idea much further with a very large corpus of like human knowledge, somehow there's some really amazing stuff that does happen on these large language models. And I think that realization are around happen at around, you know, chat uh, at GPT three. Uh, three, five getting pretty good. And then at four, we're like, oh my God, this stuff can really kind of seems like it can think or be smart to be very helpful. Um, so yeah. The thing that I think impresses me the most about these is they seem, and 
people can tell me it's statistics and uh, you know I'll, I'll believe them but it seems like they have an understanding of the context of what they're talking about more than just predicting like Humpty Dumpty set on the what it set on yeah. the wall right <laughs> obviously that's a what was likely to come next uh, when you see those that set of words but uh, there's an example that I like to play with um, which I, I copy here I'll, I'll give it a little thing I'll say hey uh, here's a, a, a program Python program. I'm going to ask you questions about it. Let's call it Arrow. And it's like this is a highly nested program that function that tests whether something's a platypus. I saw this example somewhere and I thought, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. But it has this, if it's a mammal, then if it has fur, then if it has a beak, then if it has a tail and you can just do stuff that's really interesting. Like I'll ask it to, a um, is bird or something like that or is re like yeah, yeah, yeah. Rewrite it. Right, it using garden clauses to be not nested, right? Oh, uh, yeah, right. And it'll say, Sure, here we go. And instead of being if this, then nest if this, then if this, it'll do if not, if not, return false, right? Which is uh -huh. which is really cool. And that's that's kind of a pretty interesting one, but like, um, this is this is the one, this is the example that I think is crazy is rewrite arrow to test for. Uh, crocodiles they're using <laughs> that it's like what what people would call a uh, one shot a few shot example of like mm -hmm. hey here's a pro here's an example of the kind of stuff i might want there, there's some there are different ways to to do that but it's a pattern in prompt engineering where you'll say you have a zero shot one shot few shot examples we, we could get into but like it does feel like it understands the code right like what you're trying to do right uh, just for people listening it said okay here's a function is crocodile if not self thought is reptile if not self thought has scales these are false examples right and it if it has four legs and a long snout and it can swim right like it it rewrote the little tests and stuff right in a way uh, that seems really uh, unlikely that that's just predicting just likelihood because it's never seen anything like this really which is really it's pretty mind blowing, I think. Or it, or it had like it read the entire internet and all of GitHub and that kind of stuff. So it has seen <laughs> exactly similar things. The thing that's mind boggling is just like can like when you think about what it did there is it read the the entire you know, conversation so far your your input prompt and it has like a system prompt ahead of time that says you know your chat GPT try to be helpful to people and here's a bunch uh -huh. of things that you should mm -hmm. or should not stay in non bias you try to be <laughs> concise and good and, and virtuous and, and people have found all sorts of jailbreaks out of that but like <laughs> all it does from that point on is i like, try to predict the new the next word which is kind of insane that it gets to you know the amount of structure that that we see right here. right that that's a lot of structure there right so uh, pretty yeah. impressive um and, and chat GPT is starting to grow. You know, you've got version four and you can start using some of the plugins. It's going to keep going crazy there. Other examples are uh, Assembly AI just released Lemur, which is a large language model, but really focused on transcribing speech, which I think is kind of cool. Microsoft mm -hmm. reduced Microsoft Security, co released Microsoft Security Copilot, which is a large language model to talk about things like Nginx misconfiguration <laughs> and stuff like that. There's just, there's just a lot of... A lot of stuff out there that's that's uh coming along here right a lot of thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, type of thing on the on the open source front too there's there's a whole ethical thing like should everyone and anyone have access I, you know access to open source models doing that while well, we don't really understand and we probably shouldn't get into the ethics um part of the debate here because that's a whole you know series of episode we probably won't <laughs> want to get into but what's interesting is you know Databricks came up with a model for what it's called. Facebook call, came up with one called Lama, and they, they open source or, and or leak the weights. So you have the actual model topology with the pre-trained weights. In some cases, there's open source corpus of training that are also um, coming out and are also open source. So that means like, uh, and, and these these open source models are somewhat competitive or increasingly competitive uh, with GPT-4. Um, yeah, which is kind of crazy. And some of them I don't, or where GPT-4 has limitations, they break through these limitations. So one thing that's really important is the, as a current limitation of the GPT models and LLMs is um, the, the prompt window, the token prompt window. So basically when you ask a question, um, you know, it's been, it's been trained and has machine learn 
with data up to, I, I think in the case of GPT-3, 5, or 4, it's uh, the corpus of training goes all the way to fall 2021. So if you ask, like, who is the current president of the United States, it, it just doesn't know. Or it will tell you, as, it, as of 2021, it is this person. Um, but so if you're trying to do tasks, like what I've been working on, we'll probably get into later in the conversation, is trying to generate SQL. Um, it doesn't know your table. So you have to say, like, hey, here's all the tables in my database. Now can you generate SQL that does X on top of it? And uh, that context window is is incre is limited uh, and increasing. But some of these open source models have different types of limitations. They might have like 2x, 4x, 5, 10x, you know, 10x the limitation that uh, GPT-4 might have. Right. It's interesting to ask it questions, right? But it's it's more interesting from a software developer perspective of can I teach it a little bit more about what my app needs to know or what my app structure is, right? In your case, I want to use um, Superset to ask the database questions. But if I'm going to bring in AI, it needs to understand the database structure so that when I say, help me do a query to do this thing, it needs to know what the heck to do, right? The table, it needs to be like, so there's the stuff it knows and the stuff it can't know. And some of it goes, is related to the fact that whether this information is going to public on the internet, whether it has happened to be trained against it. And then if it's in private, there's just no hope that it would know about you know, your own internal documents or your database structures. In our case, um, it speaks SQLs very, very well. So as we get into this example, like how to get GPT to generate good SQL in the context of a tool like Superset or SQL Lab, which is our SQL IDE. Um, so it knows how to speak SQL super well. It knows the different dialects of SQL very, very well. It knows its functions, its dates functions, which you know a lot, a lot of the SQL and like the engineers on the call, are like yeah, I can never remember like what Postgres date diff function is. Mm -hmm. Which at GPT or GPT the models just it knows SQL, it knows the dialects, it knows the mechanics of SQL, it understands data modeling, foreign keys, joins, primary, key, all this stuff it understands. It, has, it knows nothing about your specific database. Uh, the, the, you know, the schema names and the, the table names, and the column names that they might be able to use. So that's where we need to start providing some context. And this context window is limited. So it's like, oh, how do you um, use that context well or as as well as possible? And that's the field. And the some of the ideas behind it is prompt crafting and prompt engineering, which uh, we, we can get into once, once we get there. Maybe we're there already. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think where I see this stuff going is from this general purpose knowledge starting to bring in more private or personal or internal type of information, right? Like our data about our customers is like structured like this in a table and here's what we know about them. Now let us ask questions about our company and our, our thing. Right. And it's like starting to make inroads in that direction, I think. Yeah. And what, you know, one thing to know about is, um, now, there's different approaches to um, teach or provide that context. So one would be to build your own model from scratch, right? Um, and that's pretty prohibitive. So you'd have to, you know, find the right corpus. And instead of starting with a model that knows SQL and needs to know your table and context, you have to start from from zero and very prohibitive. Another one is you start from a base model at some point of some kind. There's a topology, so there's you know different layers and number of neurons and it knows some things. And then you load up some weights that are open source. And then you say, I'm going to, I'm going to tune this model to teach it my the database schemas and basically my own corpus of data. So it could be your data dictionaries, could be your internal documents. It could be uh, your GitHub code, your DBT projects. If you have one, your airflow DAGs, be like, I'm going to dump all this stuff in the model and that will be get baked into um, the neural network itself. Um, that's, doable, pretty prohibitive in this era. Um, if you have the challenge that we have at Preset, which is we have multiple customers with different schemas, we can't have spillover. So you have to, to train a model for each one of our customers and serve a model for each one of our customers. So still pretty prohibitive. And a lot of people mm -hmm. fall back on this uh, third or fourth method that I would call prompt engineering, um, which is 
I'm going to use the base model, the open API, the open AI API, or, or just an, an API on the LLM. And then I will, if no SQL already, I'll just say, hey, here's a bunch of tables that you might want to use. Can you generate SQL on top of it? So then that's just a big request with a lot of context. And then we then we have to start thinking about maximizing the use of that context window to pass the information that's most relevant within the limits allowed by the specific model. Right, and that starts to get into reproducibility, um, accuracy, uh, and just those limitations, which is kind of an engineering type of thing, right? Yeah, and then, you know, may maybe a topic too, and, you know, this conversation is based on a recent blog post and the flow, just going back to the flow of that blog post, so we started by establishing the premise that everyone is trying to bring AI into their product today, right? Thousands of product builders are currently exploring ways to harness the power of AI in the products and experiences they create. Uh, that's the premise for us with text to SQL and SQL Lab as part of Superset and Preset. But um, I don't know, like if you think of any product, any startup, any SaaS product you use, if you work at HubSpot today, you're trying to figure out how to leverage AI to build, you know, sales chatbots or SDR chat chatbots or everyone everywhere is trying to figure that out. And the challenge is, uh, the challenge is, I guess, very probabilistic in a different interface to anything we know. Like, you know, engineers would be like, oh, let's look at an API and leverage it. And APIs are very, very deterministic in, in general. Um, AI is kind of wild beast to tame. <laughs> you know, you ask first, the interface is language, not code. And then what comes back is like semi-probabilistic in nature. Um, and it could change underneath you. It's a little bit like web scraping in that regard that like it does the same, it does the same. And then, you know, something out there changed, not your code. And then a potentially different <laughs> behavior comes back, right? Because they may have trained another couple of years, refined the model, switched the model, changed the default temperature, all these things. Yeah, there's a lot that can happen there. One thing I noticed, like starting to work with what I would call prompt crafting, which is, you know, you work with chat GPT and you um, you craft different prompt with um, putting emphasis in a place or another or changing the order of things or just changing a word, right? Just say like important exclamation, exclamation point, capitalize the words, you know, the, the reserved words in SQL. And then just the fact that you put important exclamation point you know, we'll make it do it or not do it, um, changing from a model to another. So one thing that's great is the model, at least at OpenAI, are, um, they are immutable as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but like if you use GPT-3.5 Turbo, for instance, that's just one trained model. Um, I believe that that is immutable. Um, the chatbot on top of it might uh, get fine-tuned and change over time, but the, the model... Is supposed to be static. You mentioned temperature. It'd be kind of interesting to, to just mention for those who are yeah. not familiar with that. So when you interact with AI, one of the core parameters is temperature, and it's it's uh, I think it's a value from zero to one, or I'm not sure if you know how exactly um, you you pass it, but it basically defines how creative you want the you want to let the AI be, like how. If you put it to zero, you're gonna have something more deterministic. So asking the same question should lead to a similar or the same answer, though not in my experience. Um, it feels like it should, but it doesn't. But then if you put it higher, it will get more creative. Um, could talk more about like how how that actually seemed to work behind the scene. Yeah, well, the that variability seems to show up more in the image-based ones. So for example, this article, this blog post that you wrote, you have this image here and you said, oh, and I made this image from Midjourney. Yeah. I've also, I was, I got some examples of a couple that I did. Where did I stick them? Somewhere, here we go. Where I asked just for like YouTube thumbnails, I asked Midjourney for like a radio astronomy example that I can use. Cause here's one that's not encumbered by, you know, some sort of licensing, but still looks yeah. kind of cool and is representative, right? And and there it's like massive difference. I don't, I'm not sure how much difference I, I've seen. I know it will make some, but I haven't seen as dramatic of a difference on like chat GPT oh, versus chat GPT, yeah. 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 I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly how they introduced the variability on the generative images AI, 
right? I know it's like this multi-dimensional space with a lot of words it's and crazy, a lot of yeah. images in there. <laughs> and then it, it's probably like where the, the, the location point of that, the ren hmm. random, uh, like the, they randomize that point in that multi-dimensional space. For ChatGPT, it's pretty easy to reason about. And I might be wrong on this. Again, I'm not an expert, but you know how the way it works is it writes, it takes the prompt and then it comes up with the next word sequentially. So for each word, for the next word, so Humpty Dumpty sat on A, it might be wall at 99%, but like there might be 1% of, you know, uh, fence or something like that. <laughs> and if you you up the temperature, um, there's it's more likely to pick the, the non-first word in, in that probably less. So they probably do in a weighted way. Like it's possible that I take the second or the third word uh, randomly. And then of course, it's gonna like get a tree or decision tree. Once it picks the words, the next word is also changes. So as you up that, it goes down path that sends it into more creative or different right, right. outcome. Yeah, a little butterfly effect. It makes a different yeah. choice here and then it sends it you know sends it down through the the graph interesting so one thing that you really pointed out here and i think is, is maybe worth touching on a bit is this idea of prompt engineering there's even places like learnprompting.org that like try to teach you how to talk to these things and and you make a strong distinction between prompt crafting or just talking to the ai versus like really trying to put an engineering focus on it do you want to yeah, talk about that differentiation I yeah, I think it's a super important differentiation, but one that I'm proposing, right? So I don't think that people have settled as to what is one or what is the other. I think I saw a Reddit post recently that was like, prompt engineering is just a load of crap. Like, you know, anyone can go because they thought their their understanding of pr prompt engineering was like, oh, you know, you fine tune or you craft your prompt and you say like, you are an expert AI working on, you know, creating molecules. Now can you do this? And then, you know, by <laughs> doing that, you, you might get a better outcome or a uh, one really interesting thing that people have been doing in prompt crafting um, that seemed to have like huge impact on, there's been paper written on this specific um, just hint or, or craft tweak is let's, proceed step by step um so basically whatever the question mm -hmm. is that you are asking specifically around like more mathematicals or like things that require more systematic step-by-step -step thinking the whole like just like let's think let's expose this or let's go about it step by step makes it much better so here you might be able to uh well <laughs> so, so yeah. you know if, yeah, if you go. had a, if you had an example where chat gpt3 failed or chat gpt4 uh, failed um you could just say colin let's go step by step and it might succeed that that time around Which right kind of maybe you can get it to help you understand instead of just get the answer right like factor this polynomial uh into its primary you know, solutions or roots or whatever. And you're like, okay, show me step. Don't just show me the answer. Show me step by step so I could understand and try to learn from what you've done, right? Yeah, I mean, if you think about how the way that it's it's trying to come up with a new word, if all it does is a language-based answer to a mathematical question, like how many days uh, are there between this date and that date? Um, there's no, that specific example might not exist or it's kind of complicated for it to go about it. But if you say, let's think step by step, okay, there's this many months, this month's duration is this long, there's this many days since the beginning of that month and might get it right that, you know, that time around. Right. Or if it fails, you could pick up part way along where it has some more. Um, yeah. You know, and then you can trace, I mean, just you too. Like, I think, you know, one thing is like, you should be extremely careful as like taking for granted that it's right all the time, you know? So that means like, it also helps you review its process and where it might be, be wrong. But back to crafting versus engineering. So crafting would be the process that I think is is more attached to a use chat GPT every day. The same way that, you know, we've been trained at Googling, you know, over the past like two decades, um, you know, use, a, use quotes, use plus and minus and, you know which keywords to use intuitively, right? You know where it's going to get confused or not. So I think prompt crafting is a different version of that that's just more worthy. And if you're 
you know, you're working with the AI to try to assist you write your blog post or to try to assist you in any task, really, or just to be smart about how you bring the context, how you tell it to proceed, uh, goes a very, very long way. So that's what I call prompt crafting, call it like one of cases. Um, kind of what, what people do when they're interacting with, with the large language model. I think so, right? Like it's not evident for a lot of people will like are, are exploring the edge of where it fails and they love to see it fail. And and then they, they don't think about like, oh, what could I have told it to get the answer I was actually looking for? Like, ah, I got you wrong. You know, it's as, as exactly. if I had that actor in a conversation. I'm like, ah, you're wrong and I told you so. You know, so I think there, there's a lot of that online, but I think for all these examples that I've seen, I'm really tempted to take the prompt that they had and then give give it an instruction or two or more and then and figure out how to get it to come up with the right thing. So prompt crafting, super important skill. Um, you know, you could probably get a boost of, for, for most knowledge information workers, you'll get a boost of 50% to 10X for a lot of the tasks you do every day if you use AI well. So it's great personal skill to have. Uh, go and develop that scale if you don't. Prompt engineering, in my case, I'm like, you're building something, you're using an AI as an API behind the scene. Um, you want to pass it a bunch of relevant contexts, um, really specify what you want to get out of it. Maybe you even want to get a structured output, right? You might, might want to get a JSON blob out of it. And you say, like, return a JSON blob with the following format um, so it's more structured. So then to give all these instructions is this idea of providing few shots to, you might be storing context in a vector database. I don't know if we're gonna get into that today, but there, <laughs> there are ways to, um, to, to kind of structure and organize your potential embeddings or the things you wanna pass as context. So there's a lot here. Um, I think somewhere too, I talk about prompt engineering. If we'd scroll in the blog post, of like what is uh, in prompt engineering, it will list um, the kind of things it might be higher in the post. Sorry, we're scrolling for yeah, people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to introduce what is what is prompt engineering. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's not it's above above this section about uh, so making making you scroll at the beginning of like what is prompt engineering. Um, yeah, here you. Yeah, oh yeah, right here. That the definition of this is Chad GPT's version of it. So when you do prompt engineering, you can add context. Which that means that you're gonna have to retrieve context maybe from a database from a user session, uh, from your Redux store if you're in the front end, right? So you're going to go and fetch the context that's relevant in the context of the application, at least while building products. Uh, specifying an answer format, you could just say, yes, I just want a yes or no, a Boolean. Or I want a JSON blob with not only the answer, but your confidence on that answer or something like that. Uh, li limiting scope, asking for pros and cons incorporating very great, uh, verification or, or sourcing. So that's more, you know, if you iterate on a prompt, you're gonna be rigorous about, is this prompt better than the previous prompt I had? Like this, if I pass five rows of sample data while doing text to SQL, does it do better than if I, or does it do more poorly than if I pass 10 rows of sample data or provide a certain amount of uh, column level statistics? So prompt engineering is not just prompt crafting, it is like, bringing maybe the scientific method to it, bring some engineering of, of like fetching the right context and organizing it well, and then measuring the outcome. Right, exactly. Something that comes out, you can measure and say, this is you know 10% better by my metric than it was before with this additional data, right? That's, that's a big difference. Right, and then there's so many things moving, right? Like, and everything is changing so fast in the space. So you're like, oh, well, chat GPT-5 or you know, GPT-5 is out or GPT-4 Turbo is half the price and then just came out. Now I'm just going to move to that. They're like, wait, is that is that performing better? Or, you yeah. know, like what are, what are the trade-off? Or even I'm going to add, I'm going to move this section, you know, asking for a certain JSON format above this other section. I'm going to write important exclamation point do x does that improve my result or does that messes mess it up and which one of my test case perhaps that succeeded before fails now and which one failed before succeeds now so you can be like is that a better uh, a worse um iteration towards my goal right right Tr kind of train bringing this unit testing tdd mindset Yes. Yeah. So that's what, yeah. we're, that's what we're getting deeper into the blog post, right? So the blog yeah. post is um, talking about 
bringing this TDD, the test-driven development mindset to prompt engineering, right? And there's a lot of uh, things that are in common. You can you can take and apply and kind of transfer just over. But there are some things to that breakdown that are fundamentally different between testing a prompt or working with AI and working with, you know, uh, uh, just a bit more deterministic um, code testing type framework. We can get into that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you called out a couple of, of reasons of why TDD is important for prompt engineering. Maybe we could run through those. Yeah, so, you know, the, the first thing is um, the AI model is not a deterministic things, right? You, you use a modern API or a GraphQL REST API. The, the format of what you ask is extremely clear. And then the format of what you get back is usually defined, defined by a schema. It's like very deterministic, right. pretty guaranteed that you're, you do the same request, so you'll get the same output-ish or at least format. Um, with AI, that's not the case, right? So it's much more unpredictable and probabilistic by nature. Uh, second one is handling complexity. So uh, AI systems are complex, black boxy, kind of unpredictable too. So uh, em embrace that and assume that you might get something really creative coming out of there for better or <laughs> for worse. Um, and then reducing risk, like you're shipping product, you know, if you're shipping product, writing product, um, you don't want necessarily like, any sort of like um, bias or weird thing like the AI could go a little crazy and, and yeah stay. there are examples of ais going crazy before like tay yeah. uh, do you remember microsoft tay i don't know that one but i know so, of other examples yeah of yeah i mean it came out and it was like this this sort of just you know i'm here to learn from you internet and people just turned it into a racist and made it do all sorts of horrible things and they had to shut it down a couple of days later because it just <laughs> it's like whoa it met the internet and the internet is mean so uh that's not yeah. great yeah, train it on a uh, 4chan or let yes, it, I you know, it go crawl possibly. 4chan and reddit and that's not always going to be nice <laughs> so bad, right yeah. i mean you, you, you don't entirely control what's going to come out of those things and so you oh, yeah or i would be say a like, little more predictable right and it's not even like you don't entirely control it's like i think yeah like basically you know control might be a complete illusion like even the people working at open ai don't fully understand what's happening in there you know <laughs> yeah like well it read a bunch of stuff and it's predicting the next word and uh it gets most things right by the way like they do a lot around this idea of like not necessarily tdd but there's a whole eval framework so you can submit your evaluation functions to open ai and as they they train the next version of things they include that in hmm what their evaluation system for the new thing. So say if I wanted to go and contribute back a bunch of like text to SQL type use cases as they call evals, then they would take that into consideration when they, they train their next models. All right, so going down the list, reducing risk, right? So you're integrating some that beast that's not fully tamed into your product. So you probably wanna make sure it's tamed enough to live inside your product. Uh, continuous improvements I, that should have been maybe the first one in the list is you're iterating on your prompts you're trying to figure out a past context um you're, you're you're trying different model versions maybe you're you're trying some open source models or the latest gpt cheaper greater thing um so you want to make sure that as you iterate you're getting to the actual outcomes that you want systematically and performance measurement too, of like how long does it take? How much does it cost? Um, you you kind of need um, to, to have a handle on that. Like the, the new model might be 3% better on your corpus of tests, but it might be six times the price. Like, do, do you want, are you okay with that? Too? Right, right. Or just slower. slower from a user perspective. Yeah. yeah. Time to interaction. You know, that's one thing with AI we're realizing now is a lot of the prompts on, on four will be like, you know, two to uh one to seven seconds which in the google era you know there's been some really great papers out of google early on that um proved that you know it's like 100 milliseconds as an impact on user behaviors and how long they <laughs> right say. yeah people give up on checkout flows or whatever and going to the next part of your site on a Measurably on a hundred millisecond blocks, right? When you're talking, well, here's seven thousand, you know, here's seventy of those. That's going to have an effect potentially. 
Oh, it, it, it has, has been proven and very intricate in, in usage pattern, session duration, session outcomes, right? And, and you know, a second is a mountain. If, if today, like we were just A-B test Google between like whatever millisecond it's at now, to like just one second or half a second, that the results coming out of that A-B test would, would show very, very different behaviors. Wow. I think crazy. there's and there's some, don't quote me on it, there's some really great papers, you know, written on TTI and, and just time to interaction and the way it influences uh, user behavior. So we're still, you know, in the AI world, it has to, if you're going to wait two to seven seconds for your prompt to come back, it's got to add some real, some real important value to what's happening. Yeah, it does. I think it's interesting that it's presented as a chat. Right. I think that gives people a little bit of a pause. Like, oh, it's talking to me. So let's let let's let it think for a second rather than it's a website that's supposed to give me an answer. Yeah, compared to then I guess your basis for comparison is a human, not a you know, a website yes. or not comparing <laughs> against Google. So that's great. Yeah. I ask it a really hard question. Give it some time, right? Like that's not normally how we think about these things. Okay. So you have a kind of a workflow from this engineering, building a product, testing. Uh, like an AI inside of your product. You want to walk us through your workflow here? Yeah, and you know, if you, if you, I think I looked at TDD, you know, and and <laughs> originally, what is the normal like TDD type workflow? And I just adapted this little sk the diagram um, mm -hmm. to 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 prompt engineering, right? Because the whole idea of the blog post is to to bring prompt engine like TDD mindset to prompt engineering. So. Uh, this is where, where I went, but yeah, the, the workflow is like, okay, define the use case and desired AI behavior. What are you trying to solve with AI? In my case, uh, the example that I'll, I'll use and, and, and try to reuse throughout this presentation is uh, throughout this you know conversation is, um, you know, text to SQL. So like we're trying to, with a user prompt, with a database schema, get, get the AI to generate good, good, useful SQL, find the right tables and columns to use that kind of stuff. Uh, create test cases so it's like okay if i have this database and i have this prompt uh, give me my top five salary per department on this H hr data set there's a fairly deterministic output to that you could say the sql is not necessarily deterministic there's different ways to write that sql but there's a deterministic data frame or result set that might come there, up. there is a right answer of the top five salaries <laughs> that's <laughs> right, right. So you well, see, like, am i going to ultimately get that and it's great if it's if it is um, deterministic because you can test it. If you, you know, if you if you're trying to use AI to say write an essay about uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, second conquests, you know, um, in, in less than 500 words, it's a it's not as deterministic as it's hard to test whether the AI is doing good or not. So you might need human evaluators. But for I, I would say in most AI product or people who are trying to bring AI to their product. Um, in many cases, more deterministic. So another example of like more deterministic would say like, oh, getting, um, if you say getting AI to write Python functions, so it's like, oh, write a function that, you know, returns if a, um, if, if a number is prime, yes or no, like that you can get the function and test it in a de deterministic kind of way. So anyways, just pointing out it's better you're only going to be able to have a TDD mindset if you have like somewhat deterministic, you know, um, outcome to the right. you want to use the AI for. Then create a prompt generator. So that would be your first version. Or in the text to SQL example, it's given you know the, the the twenty tables in this database and this columns and table names and data types and sample data. Generate SQL that answers the following user prompt, and then the user prompt would say something like department by you know, top type top five salary per department. Uh, and then you, then we're getting for people uh, that are not on the visual uh, stream, not on YouTube, but on just audio, we're getting into the loop here where it's like run the test, evaluate the results, refine the test, refine the prompts, and then start over, right? And probably um, compile the results, keep track of the results so that you can compare, not just like, uh, are you 3% better on your test cases, um, but also did you, uh, which tests that used to fail succeed now, which, which tests that used to fail, uh, succeed, uh, fail now. And then, uh, once you're happy with the level of success you have, you know, you can integrate the prompt into the product or maybe upgrade uh, sh and ship it. Yeah. Ship it. <laughs> ship it. So I think it's probably uh, a good time to jump over to your 
framework for this because PyTest and other testing frameworks in Python are great, but they're pretty low level compared to these types of questions you're trying to answer, right? Like, how has this improved over time for, you know, I was doing 83% right, right? PyTest asserts a true or a false. It doesn't assert that 83% is... <laughs> Yeah, and it's the part okay, of CI. Right? Like, if if any of your your pie tests fail, um, you're you're probably gonna not CI, not allow CI, not even merge the PR, right? So one yeah. thing that's different between test driven development and unit testing and prompt engineering is that the out the out the outcome is probabilistic. It's not true or false. Too. It might just be like zero or one, right? Where or a spectrum, you know, it fails. Um, so for a specific test, you're like, oh, if it gets this column, but not this other column, you succeed at, you know, 50%. So it's non-binary. It's also, you don't need perfection to ship. You just need better than the previous version or, or good enough right. to start with. So, it's, so the mindset is, is, so there's a bunch of differences. And for, for those interested, we won't uh, get into the, in the blog post. I think I list out the things that yeah. are uh, different between the two. I think it's a little bit above this. But, um, you know, the first thing I want to say is like the level of ambition of this project versus say an airflow is super set is like very low, right? So it's maybe uh, more similar to um, a test, a unit test library and no discredit to the great, awesome like unit test libraries out there. But you would think those are fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, just the information architecture of a pie test is probably simpler than the information architecture of a Django, for instance, right? It's just right. like a different yeah. thing. And and here the level of ambition is much low, uh, much you know, for this is is fairly simple. So promptimize is something that I created, which is a, a a toolkit to help people write uh, to to evaluate and score and understand while they iterate on. Their pro while doing prompt engineering. But so in this case, I think uh, I talk about the use case I preset, which is a, we have a big corpus uh, that luckily was contributed by, I forgot which university, but a bunch of PhD people did a text to SQL um, contest. I think right? it was so they, Yale. Yale, yeah. yeah so I think Yale, it was so, Yale, yeah. So great people at Yale were like, hey, we're gonna generate, you know, 3000 prompts on 200 databases with the, the sequel that should be the outcome of that. So it's a big test set so that different researchers working on text to sequel can compare their results. Um, so for us, we're able to take that test set and some of our own test sets and run it at scale against, you know, open AI or against Llama or against uh, different models. And by, by doing that, we're able to evaluate like, uh, you know, this particular combo of like, this prompt engineering methodology with this model generates, you know, 73% accuracy. And we have these reports, we can compare, you know, fairly easily, which prompts that, as I said before, we're failing before are succeeding now and vice versa. So, you know, I mean, am I actually making progress here or, mm -hmm. or going backwards? And if you try to do that on your own, like if you're crafting your prompt, just anecdotally and try on five or six things, like you, you quickly realize like, well, shit, I'm going to need to really test I have a much broader range of tests and, and some rigor methodology around that. So right. and try, how do you remember and go back and go, uh, this actually made it better, right? Because it's, it's hard to keep all that in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And something interesting that I'm realizing to work on this stuff is like, everything is changing so fast, right? The models are changing fast. The prompting windows are changing fast. The vector databases, which is a way that organize and structure context for your prompts, evolving extremely fast. So it feels like you're working on unsettled ground in a lot of ways. Like a lot of stuff you're doing might be challenged by, you know, bar, the Bard API came out last week and maybe it's better at SQL generation than, and then it got to throw everything that I did on OpenAI. But here's something you don't throw away your test library and your use cases right? is maybe is the, the thing is the real asset here. The rest of the stuff is like, oh yeah, it's moving so fast that all the mechanics uh, of the prompt engineering itself and the interface with the whatever model is the best at the time, you're probably gonna have to throw away as this evolves quickly, but your test library 
is something really, really solid that you can perpetuate or like, you know, keep improving and bringing along with you along the way. So it's kind of an mm-hmm. interesting thought around that. Um, yeah, let's talk to this. Uh, let's talk through this example. You have on Promptimize's GitHub re- readme here to give it, make it a little concrete for people. Like how yeah. do you actually write one of these tests? Yeah, so... So there's different types of prompts, but yeah, the, you know, what I wanted to get to was just like, just like, what is the prompt and how do you evaluate it? Right. Um, and then behind the scene, we're going to be, you know, discovering all your prompts and, and running them and compiling results and reports, right. And doing uh, analytics and making it easy to do analytics on it. The examples that we have here, and I'll, I'll try to I'd be conscious of both the people who can read the code and people who don't, <laughs> like the people who are just on audio. But here, um, from Proptimize, the prompt, we import a simple prompt. And then we bring some evals that are just like utility functions around um, evaluating the output of what comes back from the AI. And here, the first prompt case in the model, here I could just create an, an array or a list of prompt cases. And it's so a prompt case, like a test case. And uh, with this prompt case, this very simple one, I say, Hello there, exclamation point. And then I evaluate that as says, you know, either hi or hello um, in the output, right? So if any of the words exist and what comes back, um, I give it a one or a zero. Framework allows you to, you could say, oh, it has to have both these words or give the percentage of success based on the number of words from this list that it has. Um, but, you know, that's, the first case, the, the the second one is like a little bit more complicated, but name the top 50 guitar players um, mm-hmm. of all time, I guess. And I make sure that Frank Zappa is in the list because I'm a Frank Zappa fan here. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you could have a, a different, you could say, hey, I want to make sure that, you know, at least three out of five of these are in the list. So those are like very more like natural language, very simple um, tests to you know, just to, so that's the hello world essentially. And then, you know, we're showing some examples of what's happening behind the scene. Well, we'll actually like call, you know, the underlying API, get the results, run your eval function and compile a report. What, what was the prompt? What was, oh, a bird just flew into my room. That's Inside? Gonna the, yeah, that's going to make the podcast interesting. Uh, oh so they, my goodness okay that, that, that might is, be a, that might be a first year um that is nuts to, oh well it's out of my room guess what there's other people in the house i'm just gonna close the door to my room <laughs> and deal with it later um all right well uh that's that's a first <laughs> uh, i've had a let's... bat fly into my house once but uh n- never a bird so yeah both are crazy uh, how, how inter- well, this, is, this is the first on the podcast out of eight years. We've never had a bird, a wild animal <laughs> enter the, the studio of the guests. Yes. Uh, well, well to my, my room, I live in Tahoe. So I guess uh, that's something that's better than a bear, you know, uh, it could have been better. <laughs> it is better than bear. All right. Uh, but yes, yeah, so like, just like keep it enumerating kind of what we're we seeing visually here. Um, you know, we'll keep a YAML file as the report output. So, so in Promptimize, you have your test case or your prompt cases, like test cases. You have an output report that says for this, you know, prompt case, here's the key. Here's what the prompt that was actually the, the user input that came in. Here's what the prompt looked like. Um, you know, what was the response, the raw response from the API? What are all the tests? How long did it run? So a bunch of metadata and, and relevant information that we can use later to create these reports. Saying like was the score zero or one, uh, so you get the whole output report here. Yeah. Okay. And then you also have a way to get uh, like a report. I'm not sure. Maybe I, I scroll past. Yeah. Right. I Where it shows you how it how it did, right? I think that was in your in your. Uh, I think at the blog post too, you see a much blog. more. There you complex, go. Yeah. yeah there it is. So this one we're running the spider data set that I just that I talked about remember it's like the Yale generated text to SQL competition you know corpus um so here we we, we looked at you know my percentage of success is 70 percent so you, you know here you say weight and score so you, there's a way to say oh this this particular prompt case is 10 times more important than another one right so you can do a relative importance of weight mm-hmm. of your different text cases um now, one thing we didn't mention too is like all these tests are generated programmatically too. 
So that it's the same philosophy behind, you know, airflow of like, you know, it's almost like a little DSL to write your test case. So you could, you know, I could read from a YAML file, for instance, in, in the case of a, what we do with spider SQL, there's a big JSON file of all the prompts and all the databases. And then we dynamically generate, you know, a thousand tests um, based on that. So you can do programmatic test definition. Uh, so more and more dynamic if you want it to be, or you could do more static if you prefer that. So in this case, sure. we're doing, um, we introduced this idea of a category too. So I, I mentioned like there's some features in, in Promptomize like categorizing your tests or um, weights, you know, and things like that. So here we'll do some reporting on, on per category, what, what is the score per category? You can see which database is per, preferring well or poorly again. So I could have another category that is, large database, small databases, and see how that, what the score is and, and compare reports. It's pretty cool that it saves the, the test run to a file that then you can ask questions about and write and generate this report on and rather than just running it and passing or failing, right? Yeah, or like giving the output and then having to run it again. Yeah, there's some mm -hmm. other features around if, so you can memoize the test. So because it has a report, so if you, like, you know, exit off of it or restart it later. Um, you, you, it, will, it won't rerun the same test if the, it's the same hash input. Even though with AI, you might get a different answer with the same <laughs> input. But at least in this case, it will say like, hey, I re I'm rerunning the same prompt instead of like waiting five seconds for open AI and then paying the tokens and paying the piper, you know, um, I'm just going to skip that. So there's some logic around skipping what's been done already right yeah that's that's really cool because it's it's not just a couple of milliseconds to run it it could be a while to get the answers yeah, yeah it's also like your early libraries i haven't written the sub the, the threading for it where you can say like oh run it on a threads um so sure you know, that's like you know things to to improve the the real leap is what we're talking Uh oh, we might have lost Max, folks. Hang tight. Hey, Max, are you back? I'm back. Yeah. Apologies. So not so. Um, I think my laptop's got some ports that it, it won't charge into. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully too much, <laughs> much disruption. Apologies for people on like we got the bird. Now we got me running out of power. Um, <laughs> but we still well, I thought maybe the maybe the bird had eaten like your power <laughs> cable or something, right? It could be a relationship between uh, a compounding effect there. But yeah, what I was going to say is like with Promptimize, I think, and, you know, the blog post is probably more impactful than the Python project itself. Um, mm -hmm. If the Python project takes off and a bunch of people are using it to test prompts and, and contribute to it, it's great. But I think it's more like, okay, this is uncharted territory, um, working with, with an AI type interface. And then it's more like, how, how do we, what's, how do we best do that as practitioners or as people building products? I think that's the, the big idea there, you know, then the test library, you could probably write your own. Like, I think for me, that was like a one or two week project. The, what I would like to say is like, normally if it wasn't for getting all the help from chat GPT on, you know, it's like, oh, I'm creating a project. I'm setting up my setup.py, you know, setup tools is always mm -hmm. a little bit of a pain in the ass and, then I'm like, can you help me set, create like my setup.py and then, you know, generate some code. And I'm like, oh, I want to make sure that PyPI is going to get my readme from GitHub. I forgot how to read the markdown and pass the stuff. Can you do that for me? And then ChatGPT generates this stuff uh, very nicely, right? Or I want to make sure I use my request that, uh, requirements of TXT inside my dynamically building my setup tools integration. Can you do that for me? And it's just like, Bam, 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 like all the repetitive yeah. stuff. I need a function. It's, it's that incredible. I, right? yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I kind of, well, I, I kind of want to close out the conversation with that. I do agree that the blog post is super 
powerful and how it it kind of teaches you to think about how might you go about testing integrating with an AI and these types of products, right? Much like TDD brought a way to think about how do we actually apply the concept just, well, I have things that I can test them with this assert thing. <laughs> how should I actually go about building software, right? So this is kind of that for, for AI integrated software. So it's certainly worth uh, people watching. Let's just close it out with, you know, you kind of touched on some of those things there. Like, you know, how do you recommend that people leverage things like chat GPT to help them build, build their, uh, their apps or, or how to use AI this kind of oh my God, yeah. like, to, like, amp up your software development. hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's been uh, a lot of people report, you know, on Twitter, people used to like, Google, um, you know, all the problems that they had while writing, yes. you know, <laughs> writing code and using a lot of stack overflow. I don't know what the stats on like, Stack Overflow traffic, but if once you try working with ChatGPT to do coding, you probably don't go back to those other flows of, I don't know, it's like putting your error message or stack trace into Google and then go into a bunch of Stack Overflow link and try to make make sense of what comes out. It, to me, it's been so much better to go just with ChatGPT and there's a conversation there too. So say for instance, if I'm in Proptimize, I need a function to say, can you write, I wrote that function before, you know, but it's a, can you crawl a certain given folder and look for modules that contain objects of a certain class mm -hmm. and then bring that back. And, you know, you have to use the import lib and just a little bit of pain in the ass to write this. So it, it writes, you know, a function that works pretty well. Then I'm like, Oh, I forgot to ask you to look into lists and dictionaries. Can you do that too? Then oh, it does that in a second. It's like, I, oh, you know, you didn't add like type hints and doc string and doc, doc test. Can you write that, you know, too? And it's a bang, bang, bang. And just like copy paste in your utils file and it works. And you save like two hours, you know? I think it would be really good at those things that are kind of algorithmic. You know, you might, they might be the kind of thing that uh, you would do on a whiteboard job interview test, right? It just, it's just going to know that really really solid it actually but it knows quite a bit about the other libraries and stuff that are out there it's insane yeah so one one thing that i came across is i wanted i leveraged something called lang chain which pointed to people uh getting interested in prompt engineering there's a really good well the, the library lang chain is really interesting mm -hmm. it's not perfect it's news moving fast but um encourage people to check it out um also like forty one thousand stars so very i know that's library. nuts right and yes, it, in Python. Yes, yeah, so you can do like, uh, uh, yeah, it's in Python too. You, you should talk to um, whoever is writing this or started this. But yeah, you can chain some prompt to say like the output of a prompt will generate the next one. There's this idea of agents. Uh, there's this idea of like, estimating tokens before the, doing the request. Um, there's a bunch of really cool um, things that it does. To me, the docs are not that comprehensive. There's someone else that uh, created, if you Google um, Lang, Change, uh, Lang Chain cookbook, you'll find someone else that wrote what I thought was more um, comprehensive way to start. Okay. Uh, this one has a YouTube video and an IP1B file, it introduces you to the concept in an interactive way. I thought that was really, um, yeah, really good. Wow. But yeah, so we were trying to, I was trying to use this. And I was like, oh, Chad, can you generate a bunch of like land chain related stuff? I was like, I don't know of a project called Lang Chain. And it was created after 2021. So I was like, oh, I wish I could just say like, just go read the GitHub, you know, just read it all, read the docs. And then um, I'll ask you questions. And um, then Chad GPT is not that great at that currently at learning things it doesn't know for a reason we talked about. Uh, Bard is much up, more up to date, so you can always for those projects. You know, ChatGPT might be better at Django because it's it's old and settled, and it's better at writing code overall. But Bard might be decent, and pretty good. For right. If you ask product. advice on how to do promptimized stuff, it's like I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's like I've never heard of. It might hallucinate too. I think if you go, it might make shit up. Like I've seen it. <laughs> like promptimized yeah. sounds like it would be this, and it just makes up stuff. So. Uh, <laughs> So not that great, but yeah, I absolutely. I encourage people to try 
you know, for any subtask that you're trying to do to see if it can help you at it and, and maybe try a, a variation on the prompt. And then, you know, if it's not good at it, just do it the, the old way. Um, but yeah, it might be better too for those familiar with the idea of like functional programming where each function is more deterministic and can be reasoned about and unit tested in isolation. Uh, chat gpt is going to be better at that because it doesn't know about all your other packages and modules so really great for the utils functions are very deterministic yeah. functional um super great at that another thing is uh, and i don't you tell me when we run out of time but another thing that that was really um interesting too of you know bring the some of the concept and promptimize and writing the blog post itself right and things like hey i'm thinking about the difference of like the properties of test driven development as it applies for prompt engineering. Uh, here's my blog post, but can you think of other differences between the two that are very core? And, you know, can you talk about the similarities and the differences? And it would come up with like just really, really great ideas, right? Brainstorming and just very yeah. smart at mixing I, concepts. I do think one thing that's not a great idea is just say, write this for me. But if you've got something in mind and you're going to say, give me some ideas or how should I go, where should I go deeper into this? And then you use your own creativity to, to create that. I, that's a totally valid use. I wouldn't feel like, Oh, well, I'm reading this AI crap, right? It just, it, it brought out some insights that you had forgot to think about. And eh, now you, now you are right. Or when it fails, it's just saying like, I got it to fail. AI is wrong. I'm smarter than it. You're like, <laughs> wait, is there something I can, can I try to, you know, here's what it didn't get right and why like what did i need to tell it so you can go and edit your prompt or ask a follow-up and generally it will it will do better and well you know? yeah i think also you can ask it to find bugs or security vulnerabilities yeah right you're like here here's my 30 line function do you see any bugs do you yeah do you, do you see it do you see any security vulnerabilities you're like yeah you're um you're passing this straight to uh you're concatenating the string in a sequel or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the rigor, yeah, the rigor stuff too. Um, or like, you know, I would say writing a good doc string, writing doc tests, writing unit tests, um, reviewing the logic, that kind of stuff. It does uh, type hints, right? If you're mm -hmm. like, you're like me, like I don't really like to write type hints up front. Um, but I'm like, can you just like sprinkle some type hints on top of that? Retrofit this thing for me. Yeah, that's it. Just make it that uh, production grade. You know, one thing that's interesting too of like, you know, you would think I'm a big TDD guy. Like I, I don't do test driven. <laughs> it's just not my thing. I, I like to write code. I don't think of like what I'm going to use the function for and uh, before I write it. Uh, but like generating, it's good at generating unit tests for a function mm -hmm. too. And then I think what's interesting with Promptimize too is you might I think you want deterministic what I call prompt cases or test cases, but you can say, I've written, um, you know, five, five or six of these, can you write variations on that theme too? So you can use it to generate test cases in the case of like TDD, but also the opposite, like for, for promptimize, you can get it to generate stuff dynamically too. Yeah. Yeah, itself. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. It is it is pretty. Let, let's maybe close this out, but I'll, I'll ask you one more question. Okay, can, can I do one more? Can I show one more? Yeah. This is the Python yeah, podcast. Yeah, get it, get it uh, in, let's do it. If you go on my re on that repo for Promptimize under examples, yeah. there's one called Python examples. Uh, there we go. All right, examples. Examples. Yeah, Python examples. Python examples. So if you scroll down a little bit further where you'll see a list of tests a little bit further still. <laughs> that here we go, something like this. The, yeah, something like this. So let's stop right here. Um, so say here it says, so here I wrote a prompt that asks the bot to um, generate Python function. Then I sandbox it and, and bring the function I wrote into the interpreter. And then I test it. So I say, Write a function that tests if a number is a prime number returns a, uh, and returns a Boolean. And then I test, I have, you know, six state te test cases for it. So write a function that finds the greatest common de denominator of two numbers, right? Um, and then behind the scene, if, if we won't get into the class above, mm -hmm. the class above, like, basically interacts with it, gets the input, then runs the test and compiles the results, right? So we could test, you know, how 
well, um, 3.5 compares to 4. But sure. I, I thought it was relevant for the, the Python folks on the line. So we're testing yeah. out what it is at writing Python functions. Write a function that generates the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. Up Very to a cool. certain number of terms, right? So it's easy to test. So it's cool stuff. And uh, what was your uh, last question? Oh, I was going to say something like, see if I, see how far we could push it. Um, write a Python function to use requests and beautiful soup to scrape the titles of episodes of Talk Python to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. And sure. then, yeah, here it is. And if you don't have a, you know, one thing that's a pain in the butt for podcast people is to oh. write the, like what, we, what all we talk about. So you use another AI to get the transcripts, right? It's like, can you write something mm -hmm. that's going to leverage this library to transcript the library, summarize it and publish it back on the, it's, uh, with SEO in mind. Yeah, it's, it's really quite amazing. It went through and said, okay, here's a function. And it knows talkpython.fm slash episode slash all. Hughes H, get the title, and let's let's just finish this out, Max. I'll throw this into a an interpreter, see if it runs. <laughs> interpreter, and I'll see if I can get it to run. Um, hey, hey, you know uh, what's really interesting too is like you can give it a random function, like you can write a function and say like yeah. if you know write a write a certain function that does certain things, and you say if I give the this input to this function, what is it going to come out of? And it doesn't have an interpreter. But it, it can interpret code like you and I do, right? Like, mm -hmm. like an interview question of like, hey, here's a function. If I input a three as a value, what's going to come? What's going to return? So it's able to do the, follow the loops, you know, follow the if statements, and basically just do a logical. Yeah, I, yeah. Another thing I think would be really good is to say, here's a function. Explain to me what it does. Oh yeah, it's super great at that. It's great at that for yeah. SQL too. Here's there's a stupid long SQL query. Can you explain yeah. to me? No, it does. <laughs> it's like oh, the explanation is on. Can you just summarize that in three hundred you know, words? Yeah, let's go step by step. Let's do step by step. <laughs> What's this do? But yeah, yeah I mean, that, like, maybe a closing statement is like this stuff is changing our world. Like for me, I'm interested in like, how it's changing how we're building products. You know, but uh, it, the, the core things that as a as a data practitioner, as a Python expert, as a programmer, it's really changing the way people work day after day faster than, than, than we all think. Um, and, and across the broad, like, you know, you might understand pretty well, it's changing your daily workflow as an, in, as a software engineer, but it's changing people like people's workflow do chemistry or like, mm -hmm. like in every field, there's a lot we can leverage here. Um, if you use it well. Right. Take this idea and apply it to, you know, whatever uh, vertical you want to think of. It's it's doing the same thing there, right? Medicine 100%. all over. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. All right. Well, let's uh, let's call it a call it up. I think we're we're out of out of time here. So, uh, really quick before um, before we quit, PyPI package to recommend. Maybe something. AI related that you found recently, like all oh, this thing's cool. People should check it out. Uh, Promptimize, I think it would be, uh, you know, something to check out. I think there's something called Future Tools. So you could try to navigate mm -hmm. there, but it's it shows like all of the AI powered tools that are coming out, and it's it's oh, hard nice. to keep up. Yeah, like, yeah, I think I have seen that. Yeah. And then uh, if you if you want to keep up on a daily with what's happening in AI, there's you know TLDR AI. Uh, they have like a, a DL with okay. the re relevant list for the day. I think that's a, it's, it's hard to, to stay on. To, I prefer like the weekly <laughs> digest of what's going <laughs> on in AI. Of, uh, a, uh, just a stream of information. Huh? Just, yeah, it's kind of dizzying and it's like, oh, this new model does this. Like I've got to change everything to that. And then, then something else, if you, Exactly. If you update the correct course too often and you just like you know do nothing because you're like the foundation the foundation shifting too fast under you so yeah absolutely well very cool all right and then final question if you're gonna write some python code what editor are you using these days uh i'm a vim user yeah, yeah I, I i know it's not the best i'd like i know all the limitation but it's like muscle memory and uh i i i'm a UX guy now working on supersets. I do appreciate the development of all the 
the the new IDEs and the functionality that they have, I think it's it's amazing. It's just like uh, for me, it's all like I know all my bash commands and big commands and sure. bindings and muscle memory. So I just do things that way still. Absolutely. All right. Well, Max, thanks for coming on the show, helping everyone explore this wild new frontier of AI and large language models. And for yeah, well, like, you know, explore it while we're explore it while we're still relevant because I don't know how long we're going to be <laughs> relevant for. Um, so yeah, yeah, Hurry yeah. Up. Enjoy, enjoy it while we can. Right, get out there. <laughs> Either control the robots or be uh, controlled by them. So get yeah. on the right side of that. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. As always.